Yeah, let's go. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar on utility emergency preparedness, mitigating the impacts of a global pandemic for our overseas utility partners in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. My name is Marjorie Jean-Pierre. I'm the program director at the U.S. Energy Association. For those who aren't familiar with USCA, we're an association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations and government agencies, which represents the broad interest of the US energy sector, both in, by increasing the understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally. These activities are done through our membership activities, as well as our government funded programs. Um, I manage our Energy Utility Partnership Program, which is funded and collaborated and supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development, which we have been fortunate to have a long-standing relationship with for almost 25 years, if not longer. The objective of our Energy Utility Partnership Program is to strengthen the capacity of our overseas partners by assisting them with effectively managing and operating their power systems. This is done through our capacity of uh, building activities, which are the core and the backbone of which is our volunteers. And uh, this webinar is another example of our volunteers as they're taking the time for U.S. companies to actually have this webinar to talk to our overseas partners in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, the representatives from our U.S. utilities and any organizations take the time to establish these peer-to-peer -peer relationships and share their experiences and best practices with our overseas utility. And this webinar is a prime example of that. Um, at a time in the world where countries and utilities are trying to adjust of what is considered working in the normal as we deal with uh, the, media, the, media, uh, the demands of this COVID-19 pandemic, we want to ha take the time to have this webinar to have a discussion on what U.S. utilities are doing to address, did you lose me? No, we can hear you fine, Marjorie. Okay. What U.S. utilities are doing to address this new normal and what strategies they are putting into place to meet these emergencies now and in the future. Um, I just want to once again thank you all for attending this webinar. It is my pleasure to now introduce Jeffrey Haney, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Economic Growth, Education, Environment, E3 of U.S. Agency for International Development. And after that, we will hear from Jim Hicks, who is our Senior Energy Consultant and a member of Mont McDonald, who will take over as moderator for the webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marjorie, and welcome, everyone. Special thanks to each of the electric power industry leaders today for carving out time to share your unique and practical perspectives as panelists today. I know you have all been putting in a heroic effort during this difficult time and we greatly appreciate your time and commitment. Uh, we'll hear from the panel today on a variety of timely topics, including crisis management, strategic resilience planning and strategies to maintain business continuity during this pandemic. I'd also like to thank USCA for organizing the event. As Marjorie noted, we have over 25 years of partnership uh, bringing the expertise of the U.S. public and private sector uh, as a critical resource for modernizing developing country power sectors. We consistently hear from our developing country partner utilities that this peer-to-peer -peer engagement is highly valued, and particularly in cases like this, where we're really all just collectively trying to navigate uncharted waters. Developing countries will likely be impacted disproportionately by the pandemic, uh, not only as an immediate health crisis, but with severe economic and social impacts over the longer term. In the energy sector, challenges common to developing country utilities, including poor service quality with frequent outages, tariffs that are not cost reflective, low levels of billing and collection, poorly trained personnel and antiquated staff and resource management systems will all exacerbate the impact of COVID-19 on the day-to-day -day operations and the commercial viability of utilities in the developing world. Adding to that challenge, the power sector is frequently a large fiscal burden on national budgets in the developing world as governments divert limited resources away from other public services such as health and education to subsidize inefficient uh, power utility. On average, developing countries spend twice as much on energy subsidies as they do on social sectors such as health and education. 
So for utilities in developing countries that are already struggling financially, a sudden loss of revenue from COVID-19 pandemic will place immediate strains on national budgets with many competing needs for those resources. Globally, we've already seen loads decline 5 to 15% from business as usual with significant variation across region and countries. Across the global energy sector, we have seen a number of strategies implemented by companies to respond to the myriad of challenges associated with COVID-19, including creative ways to maintain a healthy workforce and sustain operations during shelter in place orders. We look forward to hearing more about these actions today. As we all adopt to this new, at least short term normal, uh, firms which have already invested in digital technologies and predictive maintenance will benefit from being able to operate with fewer staff on site. However, the utility industry is especially vulnerable to cyber attacks at this time. We must take calculated steps to ensure critical infrastructure is secure. So we hope that today's discussion will help to guide and form localized decision making in response to COVID-19 global health emergency. This is certainly not a one-way flow of information. In these times, we are all learning from each other as we test solutions in a rapidly changing environment. Our hope is that by coming today to share experiences, we can mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19 global pandemic in each of our countries. Uh, we also have curated a library of resources to share with you to help you pivot and recalibrate your thinking during these times reference guides and other materials, including topics such as crisis management and response, workforce, financial reporting, operations and supply chain, cybersecurity and digitalization, customer communications and strategy will all be made available. So thank you again for joining the briefing today. I hope you enjoy the discussion. I certainly look forward to hearing from the panelists and I'll turn the floor over to Jim to moderate this session. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, again, my name is Jim Hicks. I'm a consultant with Mott McDonald assigned to help USCA on technical issues, and I will be moderating today's session. We're fortunate today that we have four speakers to uh, share their experiences with us, two from the utility industry, Harry Sedaris with Duke Energy and Paul Sabella with Southern Company, and two from utility suppliers, uh, both of them with Mortensen Corporation, Mark Kelleher who, uh, with Mortensen and Tracy Evers. I'll introduce them more formally when it's their turn to speak. <clears throat> the session today is an hour and a half long. We're dedicating the first hour to the speakers and then the second 30 minutes, uh, the remaining 30 minutes to Q&A. If you have a question, you can click on the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and put your questions in there and we'll be moderating monitoring those questions and uh, at the end of the session we'll pre present the questions. We are, are not planning to interrupt the speakers during their presentation uh, to ask them questions. We will save them till the end and then I will uh, uh, look at the questions and uh, assign them or at least coordinate the responses among the speakers. So with that, let's, uh, let's get started and get away from the introductions. Uh, or get away from the original, the opening comments. Uh, first of all, with uh, I'd like to introduce Harry Sedaris with uh, Duke Energy. He's Senior Vice President of Customer Experience at Duke Energy. He's responsible for aligning customer-focused operations and services uh, on the, uh, to, to uh, improve the customer experience. He's been with Duke Energy uh, for 23 years and prior to his current position, uh, he was over the electric distribution systems in North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Indiana, and, Ohio, and Kentucky. So with that, I'll turn it over to Harry to uh, give the presentation on Duke Energy. All right. Thank you, Jim, and hello, everyone. Um, my video is locked up for some reason, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I want to start off with giving a little bit, bit of background about Duke Energy. So Duke Energy is, is one of the largest utilities in, in the U.S., uh, we have 7.8 million customers spread out across six states, 95,000 square miles of service territory. We have 51,000 megawatts of generation. Uh, the, the, mix, uh, the mix of that is broken up 35% uh, natural gas, 34% nuclear, 26% coal, 
and 5% renewables, which is hydro, solar, and wind. We also have a Duke Energy Renewables uh, branch that uh, has 3,000 megawatts of renewable energy and solar and wind across 14 other states that we serve. Uh, 28,000 employees and usually about 20,000 contractors uh, on any given day uh, helping support that system and, and our customers. Uh, I want to talk today about the operation side and what we've done uh, to uh, deal with the COVID-19 crisis that came upon us uh, a little bit over a month ago. Uh, we started off by uh, setting some guiding principles of what we wanted to, to make sure that we uh, accomplished. Uh, those guiding principles were first keeping our employees safe, keeping our customers and communities safe, and then ultimately keeping the lights on and keeping our essential service flowing, uh, which was even more critical than it normally is as people were working from home. Uh, everybody was confined to their houses. Uh, what I told the team is the house became not just where you slept, but it became the schoolhouse. It became the restaurant. It became the church. It became the office. So it became very, very more critical to everybody's everyday life and not having electricity would add a ton of angst to an already anxious situation for folks as they couldn't do their work or do their schoolwork. Uh, so we started about a month ago. Uh, we moved very quickly. Uh, our first order of business was try to get as many folks as we could to work from home. Obviously that was challenging with IT systems, cybersecurity, other things that we had, but we were successful in a couple of days to be able to get uh, almost half of our employees, about 15,000 folks, uh, working from home and working from home effectively. We did have a few IT glitches to begin with, with some slowness, but we were able to resolve those uh, and went forward there. The, the second phase uh, of working from home took a little bit more work. So we have about 1,200 call center representatives. These are folks that are taking the calls from the customers, billing questions, outage uh, response, those type of things. Uh, so those folks started off working from their normal locations with some other precautions in place. But quickly we found that that was gonna be difficult because of just the amount of people in those confined spaces that they work in was gonna be a problem. So we moved very quickly and we moved 90% of them to work from home too, which was a monumental effort. And we did that in three days. Uh, which normally I, I told the team that would have taken us a year to do under normal situations. So everybody pulled together very well and I'm very proud of the team for that. So that left us with uh, about 14,000 of our employees that still needed to be out in the field. These are our line workers, our power plant operators, uh, our power plant uh, maintenance folks. So uh, we still had quite a few people that had to be out in the field to make sure our essential service was going. Um, so what we did for them is we put in the CDC guidelines of social distancing, trying to keep people six feet away from each other. We broke up control rooms uh, into separate control rooms where we could or different corners of the control room, uh, put barriers up between them, plexiglass, those type of things. Uh, we dispatched folks that normally go into an operation center to, to collect their material and get their guidance for the day. They were dispatched directly from the house, uh, so that limited the interactions. Uh, we provided PPE for our employees because there were situations where we, we did have to come within six feet of each other. Uh, so we did have the, the masks and the gloves and other PPE uh, equipment to protect those folks. Uh, we, we stopped accepting visitors to our site, so we put in a very stringent visitor policy. So. Uh, no, no regular routine visitors were allowed to come to any of our sites. For others that had to come into the site, we started a temperature monitoring program where the security guards were, were uh, taking temperatures of everybody coming in and anybody that had over 100.4 temperature was turned away. Um, and uh, we, we developed some new and uh, creative cleaning processes and hand sanitizing uh, and also surface cleaning. Uh, we also stop non-essential, non-critical work. So we do have some work that goes on in customers' homes. So to both protect our employees and protect those uh, customers, uh, we stopped any non-emergency, non-critical work in customer homes. 
So reading meters that are in people's homes, we quit doing that. But there was some work that happens, a gas leak, uh, a meter that's sparking, potentially causing a fire that we had to respond to. Uh, for those, we put in a process to make sure that we're taking uh, information from the customer on their health situation, but also putting protective gear on in terms of suiting, Tyvek suits, masks, respirators, gloves, to be able to go in there and handle that emergency. So some of the work went away, but then some of that emergency work, we took special precautions. On the customer side, we did some things too, knowing that our customers were gonna be suffering and having issues both from the economic effects of this, as, as well as the future economic effects of this with job losses, inability to pay their bills, the critical nature of our product. So we stopped disconnect for non-payments. Uh, we stopped charging late fees, credit card fees for people that pay their bills and bounce check fees, uh, all to help our communities and our customers uh, survive through this till they could get to a better place. Uh, we were quick to do this and early to do this, and then eventually a lot of our government officials uh, followed on and, and, uh, and made other utilities, water utilities, telephone utilities, do the same thing to protect the consumer. Um, we also did a lot of work in our communities uh, to support the food banks. We felt like the food banks were gonna get hit hard as people were out of work and struggling to make ends meet without uh, income coming in. Uh, so we, we made some donations from our foundation to the food banks that serve our territories uh, to help our communities there. So a lot of things went on in the operations space, a lot of things went on in the customer and community space, but again, our guiding principles were around keeping the employees safe, keeping the customers safe, and keeping the lights on. Uh, we did have a lot of challenges uh, and continue to have a lot of challenges every day with, with curveballs that we get thrown. And I want to talk a few of those challenges. So supply chain was a big challenge, trying to get materials, particularly masks and cleaning supplies. They were in, in short order. Uh, so our, our team did an outstanding job leveraging a lot of our vendors, le leveraging a lot of industry and government contacts to make sure that we had the proper masks for our folks that are working out in the field. Uh, we did some creative things. Uh, we worked with some of our local factories that, uh, that do some textile work uh, that had shut down. We talked to them and they were able to, to make bandanas and face masks for us. Uh, we used our chemistry lab to make hand sanitizer and disinfecting solutions. So we weren't able to get the actual products, but we were able to get ethanol and some other raw ingredients. So our lab made over 1,500 gallons of hand sanitizer and cleansing solution that we distributed to all our facilities and all our, all our employees to have to maintain that hygiene. Uh, the other challenges that we had was, was routine in nature. So in the spring, we do a lot of our uh, generation outages, our nuclear refueling outages and our, our fossil hydro uh, normal maintenance outages. That's when we bring in thousands of other employees from all across the nation to work at those sites. We had to continue that work. So uh, you can imagine, not only did we have our normal contingency of folks, but now you're adding additional people from all over the country. So the special precautions to screen them, to make sure that they, they were following the right guidelines and training, training them was significant. Uh, we've completed successfully two nuclear refueling outages and several other fossil outages, and we have two more to go this spring. The other thing that just happened this past week is we, we had some very strong tornadic and wind storm events in the Midwest, as well as in the Carolinas. We had over a million customers that lost power between those two things, two places in the last week. And uh, as you can anticipate, having our line workers out in this, trying to do their normal work in addition to dealing with the virus was very, uh, very challenging. But the team responded well. Uh, we were able to get everybody back quickly, which was uh, very welcome from our customers. And we had to do creative things. We normally call on each other and other utilities from neighboring states to come help us. That didn't work as it normally does because people are concerned about traveling across borders, sharing resources, those type of things. But uh, luckily, Duke Energy being as large as it is, we were able to bring employees from the Carolinas uh, to the Midwest and from the Midwest back to the Carolinas and from Florida up to the Carolinas to assist. So we were able to deal with that. 
The other thing that we, we found uh, our processes when, when somebody was exposed or we thought somebody was exposed, we would automatically quarantine them for 14 days to make sure that they did not become symptomatic or come down with the virus. Um, so obviously we, we lost several folks uh, to that because of all the contacts and people coming off cruise, cruises, coming from uh, overseas vacations. Uh, so we found quickly that we needed to come up with a testing solution to be able to reduce those times, both to put the employee that had been quarantined's mind at risk that didn't know whether they had it or they were going to get it, uh, and also to get them back to work where we needed them to perform their essential duties. So we were able to contract with a local health company here in Charlotte, North Carolina, that was able to do some testing for us. So that would allow us to drop that 14 days through the testing down to about four to five days of getting those food, food the peace, the folks the peace of mind of whether they had the virus and also be able to get them back to work. So that's been successful and we feel like that's gonna be critical as we come back to return to normal. So a lot of challenges, but a lot of people have chipped in and worked together just like all the countries have worked together and the United States has worked together to, uh, to deal with this uh, virus. So that's all I have, Jim. Okay, Harry, thank you much. That was great overview. Uh, let's move now a little bit west of you to the Southern Company and Paul Sabella. Paul is a, serves as a director of enterprise resilience for the Southern Company with overall responsibility for the continued development and implementation of system-wide business continuity, crisis management, and enterprise security programs. And uh, Paul has had been, been with uh, Southern Company for 26 years. So Paul, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jim, I appreciate that introduction. Appreciate the opportunity too to be on this webinar to share some of the experiences that Southern's had so far throughout this pandemic. Um, as Jim mentioned, I'm Paul Sabella. I'm Director of Enterprise Resilience at Southern Company. It's a relatively new role um, where we combine uh, some of the crisis management activities with business continuity planning, as well as some enterprise security uh, tools work. Um, so we're, we're still developing this role. Um, what I thought I'd do first is I'm gonna share some slides here uh, and give you a little bit of background on who Southern Company is, and then we'll talk through a few other areas as well. Let me. Uh, down here and share. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yep, you're good. We can all see it. Thank you. So just to give you, Harry shared uh, Duke's story a little bit. And so I thought I'd share a little bit about Southern Company as well. Um, for us, we have electric and gas utilities in, in really about seven states, but you'll see there, the majority of them are kind of clustered in the southeastern part of the U.S. Um, we are a vertically integrated utility, meaning that we have generation, transmission, and distribution. Um, with a, you know, our generation mix, I'd say, is more of an all-the-above type of strategy, where we have nuclear, fossil, hydro, renewables like solar and wind, and so on. Um, we're about 90 to 95% of our operations are coming from regulated businesses, but we do have a few other businesses um, in the unregulated space, like our unregulated wholesale generator, Southern Power, that has predominantly natural gas facilities, uh, wind farms, solar farms. Uh, and then we also have a company called Power Secure, which is focused on distributed infrastructure uh, and energy efficiency. What I really want to spend some time on, maybe start talking through first, is a little bit about our crisis management structure um, and how it kind of adapted. It really had to shift in this pandemic. Um, we, we really believe, and I think you'll hear a lot of companies say that we believe in an all hazards approach to crisis management. So we developed a structure that really is adaptable. So at, at its core, you think about it, you always, we're, we're big believers in wanting to make sure we're managing at the local level. However, you still want to have that guidance and support at the highest levels. So for us, when you look at this slide on the left side of it, you see our Southern Company Management Council, which is our really our C-suite. It's, it's the CEO and all of his directs um, providing governance and oversight for whatever the incident may be. And then you have a group called the System 
incident support team or system IST, which is kind of a little bit more of the hands and feet of the management council helping to support the initiatives. And that is chaired by our chief operating officer and our chief legal officer, um, providing support and feedback back up to the management council. And then depending on the complexity and severity of the issue, we also have operating company incident support teams. And we'll have each of, you know, one of those at each one of our, predominantly our different states. Uh, so you see some of the different states around the Southeast, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and so on. Uh, and those um, incident support teams help to support the field as they're responding to whatever the issue may be. I think, however, that what we saw is given the uniqueness of this, this pandemic, I mean, there were so many unknown characteristics of this virus. When you think about how, how symptoms were presented, how long it was gonna take you to recover, um, the availability of treatments or lack thereof, and a lot of other factors really played into this pandemic being unique. And it was important that we had a crisis management structure that was agile enough to really be able to shift and still maintain support for our, our core businesses. And so what you see on the right-hand side of the slide is more of what we did and how we leveraged that core uh, structure and bolted on some additional pieces. I think one of the first things I'd wanna highlight is the critical operations team you see in the middle of the slide. This group was formulated realizing that, you know, we have business continuity plans for all of our critical processes. But when you think about the pandemic in particular with COVID-19, there were certain groups that were gonna be impacted even more so. And so we quickly stood up this this sub team that focused on control centers, uh, energy production facilities. So that's all of our plants, including our nuclear fleet, our field delivery ops. So that's both electric and gas delivery operations, our customer service teams, supply chain management has been extremely active throughout and, and still to this day is extremely active. And then when you think about the cash in and cash out activities that our accounting finance and, and treasury organizations um, all handle. These, these critical teams were stood up pretty quickly so that we could bring together a system-wide perspective of, of all these activities and we could adjust our business continuity plans to have an addendum focused on the COVID-19 pandemic in particular. So it was, there was a foundation already in place, um, but we leveraged this team to kind of adapt to the current circumstances. I think it's also important to talk about how some of our shared services teams also um, respond to this activity. I mentioned earlier the system incident support team and that group is made up of leaders from each of our operating companies as well as key functional areas. However, there were some shared service activities that had to go much deeper. And so what we saw is as you would expect, human resources uh, has played a huge role uh, in, in, in driving through this whole process. Um, groups like our Disability Management Council and our medical directors uh, paired with the leadership of HR uh, to really think through the situation, all the frequent conversations they were having with the Centers for Disease Control and Departments of Public Health. Um, our IT group stood up its team so that they could really evaluate and, and really prepare a lot of our IT infrastructure for that move um, that we were going to be having to, to our um, to, to the remote commuting. Um, so I think all these teams really had to work together. And, you know, something else interesting with IT is I heard the comment earlier that Jeff made, we were very much focused on maintaining our cyber hygiene, especially as you move more things off of site and you're having to do things remotely from home, we were making sure we were maintaining um, good IT security. And then our corporate communication teams really coordinating across the entire system, making sure we're, we're providing sufficient messaging both internally and, and externally. And then most recently, that box at the bottom, we, we labeled the re-entry team. This is something we just stood up this week. Um, it's, it's been developing over the last few weeks, but we really stood up the team and have really kicked it off, thinking about how do we bring the workforce back? So you know, what are those prerequisite kind of triggering criteria that, that would be the signal saying, okay, it's time to start bringing some of this workforce back and at least in some sort of stage fashion. And I tell you, while we're not, we are not the front lines like the healthcare industry is, um, we are an industry that is you know, identified as critical infrastructure. And it's been so important that we have these external engagements and partnerships 
Um, they're just invaluable to maintain support and, and access to resources after, of course, the hospitals and, and medical field have been served. Um, so with those, in the top of the slide, you see I mentioned ESCC and EEI AGA. So ESCC is our electric, Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. And what they did is it's similar in a way to how we ran our critical ops team. They created these tactical tiger teams um, which focused in on, on specific areas. And, and this really is where utilities come together across all of the US and even North America. And they, we've had frequent calls, sharing and developing strategies and guide. I mean, so much of this is happening real time. And so these teams were formed um, covering everything from consult, control center sequestration plans to how we would do mutual assistance to how we can work with state and local officials to get access to restricted and quarantined areas. Uh, and there were also teams for generation, supply chain, IT and telecom and, and, and communications. And, and what came out of it is this great resource guide um, that the ESEC has out on their website. It is a public resource that anybody can go to. As a matter of fact, you can go to electricitysubsector.org and you can see the latest resource guide. And it's, it's continuing to grow and continuing to change as we learn more. I think it's on version maybe five now, and it's grown from about 10 pages to about 70, sharing different stories and different um, anecdotes and learnings um, that all of our utilities have been pulling together. So that's a great resource if you haven't had a chance to take a look at that already. Um, in addition to these industry partners, um, the ESCCs and the Edison Electric Institute and American Gas Association that I mentioned up there, we've also had vital engagements, I think, with our federal, state, and local partners. Um, they've been providing a lot of regulatory flexibility for us, and, and their foresight has, has helped us tremendously. Clearly, we work a lot with the Center for Disease Control and, and Health and Human Services and all the state departments of public health. Uh, but we've also had a good amount of interaction with our, our bulk electric system regulatory bodies like NERC and FERC, uh, helping to delay some of the new standards they were rolling out around compliance requirements. Um, all of these have been really proactive actions. Even our, our state public service commissions, I mentioned that a lot of our operating companies are state regulated utilities. We've been working a lot with our public service commissions and they've been a great uh, supporter of getting messaging out about social distancing around our crews when they're out there working, um, or you know, ma making sure we're maintaining access. Uh, you know, there's a lot of shutdowns and stay at home orders out there, and they've been a real um, supporter of getting us access to all those different areas. And even to the extent of they've worked closely with all of our operating companies in suspending disconnections for our customers, especially as you know, people are going through tough times. So I think all of this has been really productive. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention all the efforts that are happening with our Department of Energy and, and Department of Homeland Security, the, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, all of these groups working together hand in hand with the um, public and private sectors. I think FEMA's uh, state emergency management agencies all playing roles together. I'm, I'm certain I'm leaving out many others but all of them have really come together and, and you can tell how everyone's trying to work as a single team. The last slide I have really just, I just wanted to give a snapshot into kind of the current state Southern Company is in. Um, you know, unlike a lot of parts of the US, the, the Southeast appears to be heading into our, our peak in the, in the next few weeks. Um, at this point, we've been, we've been pretty fortunate to have, you know, only when I mean, we think about positive cases identified within our employee population, we're, we're about in the range of 0.2% of our employee population. That, that is very low. So we're, we're very fortunate. Um, you know, I think part of that is we've been very conservative about how we've been doing quarantines. And, and if someone has had either a confirmed case or if there's a, a chance, there's a potential exposure, we've been having those employees stay at home even for our mission essential workforce. And we've worked with our you know, medical and, and disability management teams and they've performed contact tracing to try to isolate these potential exposures. Now, I'll be realistic here right now because we have such a low amount of cases, uh, we're able to do some of this contact tracing, but to the extent that it, it were to expand like many of our other peer utilities have had happen, 
Um, I don't think he'd be able to do that extent without at least some outside assistance. <clears throat> I think another key to the success so far for Southern Company has been the decision by our senior management. Early on, we, we converted our workforce to remote working, essentially telecommuting. And you know, while you know we're, we're all critical infrastructure industries, um, some things need to be on site, but we still have around 60 to 70% of our workforce at home. And that's allowed us really to minimize a lot of potential exposures, both for our on-site mission essential workers, as well as the people that are at home. Um, another note I think that's interesting is at this point, we are not sequestering any uh, of our mission essential workers yet. We do have plans that are fully developed and ready to be executed, um, but we're, we're continuing to monitor at this point. And we'll, um, I think these next few weeks are gonna be telling. I think it's also important to call out some of the great efforts from a few of our key functional areas. Um, human resources, as I mentioned earlier, has been a huge player in this. They're having frequent or probably daily internal and external conversations, like I said, with our Center for Disease Control and the State Departments of Health. Um, but they early on helped to reframe our health threat framework. So we've got a framework that's modeled a little bit off of DHS. Uh, it's just three tiers of simple normal, uh, imminent, excuse me, elevated and imminent. Um, and they reframed that specific to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in addition to that, they created this manager's toolkit that houses all these important resources, like a few of them that I listed out here, like the HR pandemic guidelines. Um, those guidelines really helped add clarity around how we should be coding our time, you know, what kind of benefits protection. So, so for our employees uh, that are out because of the COVID-19 uh, virus, they do not need to use their sick time. Um, so there's some benefit protection there. We have in there also kind of outlines how, how you should access facilities um, and then other work practices like travel restrictions and social distancing. Um, they also created a manager response guide that kind of, it helped to address different exposures, uh, different symptom scenarios. So if, if an employee calls their manager uh, with a concern, they can they can kind of help follow that guide. It kind of gives them a tool. Uh, and the last thing really is the task-based risk assessment document. And it was created to help kind of guide workers um, to just to determine what the appropriate PPE may be for a specific work task. As Harry had mentioned at Duke, we have some employees that need to go into customers' homes. And depending on the situation and conversations with that customer, it may dictate a different level of PPE. Paul, can you wrap it up in a couple of minutes? Sure. And so you see the other things on there. We have supply chain management, doing surveys, uh, working all the different channels we can to get supplies, uh, corporate communications, um, really thinking about the communications we're doing both internally and externally. It's so important in times like this that everyone is being informed. And I'd say really in summary, our, our company values are what's driving all of our decisions. And our focus remains on, on that safety, safety of the employees and, and of the public. So, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Jim. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Well, that was the uh, perspective from two utilities. Now let's look at how suppliers uh, are reacting. And from Bortonson Corporation, uh, we have Mark Kelleher. Mark is a design manager for Morton Specializing Utility Scale Energy Storage and Electrification. He previously worked for MISO, the uh, Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, in developing their transmission uh, solicitation and award process. So, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. And actually, I'm going to let Tracy start off here. I've got the tail end of this today. So, okay, uh, Tracy? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yeah, Tracy, let me just say that Tracy is a marketing director of Power Delivery Services for Mortensen. So, uh, Tracy, will Turn it, let you go. Absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, part of what we're going to do is try to pull it together in a in a bow, so to speak, um, take from what the utilities have said. I'm not really going to spend much time on Mortensen. You can check out our web page. Um, the important thing for us is just to give you guys an idea as a supplier what we're focused on. So since we are here to support the industry and the utility, we kind of follow in step with them. And most utilities already have some kind of, in the U.S., already have a planning mechanism for addressing 
any kind of disaster. So pandemic planning typically falls under their disaster preparedness, much like you've heard both um, Harry at Duke and um, uh, Paul from Southern Company said. Um, so for a utility, typically what you want to make sure is that you're looking at a pandemic and all of the ways in which it is very different from your other types of natural um, disaster. A big part of that is because, of course, you have the revenue impact based on the information you've heard already regarding the reduc reduction in use that you see. But other, in addition to that is your operational threat, because this is a threat to your workforce a threat to the supply chain, it's a threat to so many of the other aspects that uh, um, affect your operations, this becomes um, another area you have to focus on. Specifically in a pandemic, the health impact is probably the greatest impact because here you have to plan for working with um, a very small workforce potentially. Um, you could potentially have your supply chain, like I said, which includes folks like me who are your vendors, but also your other suppliers could see a very similar impact, making them less able to support you. And of course, you are unsure about when you would return to normal. So in the, in the US, most electric um, utility industries are coordinating their efforts with their neighbors. So you heard Paul mention e the ESCC, which is the Electricity Subsector Coordinating Council. And what that is, as he mentioned, is a, a representative from all of the large utilities and some small utilities get together and coordinate their efforts along with the CDC, the World Health Organization, the, their Department of Health and Human Resources. So in planning for any pandemic, one of the key things to do is to make sure you're reaching out to your neighbors in your, um, in your region, your neighbors who are interconnected with you, as well as all the government agencies and organizations who would be supporting you. And when you do that, what you generally do is you're creating a plan that, that's wrapped around the stages, in this case, of a pandemic. So most of this information you can get from EEI, from the Department of Energy web, website, from the CDC website. I've put a couple references here. But when planning for something like this pandemic, recognizing that your plan needs to follow the stages of a pandemic. And for the sake of COVID-19 and other pandemics, there are generally three stages you talk through, which is the interpandemic phase, the alert phase, and the transition phase. And the interpandemic phase, this is where you do all of your preparation, right? This is getting ready. Um, it happens before and it also happens after because you're pulling in lessons learned and we'll walk through that very quickly. The alert phase is when you're in response. We are in alert phase in the US and in many other countries right now. In fact, everybody is in the alert phase. And then the transition phase, which is the recovery. So um, parts of China, are potentially in recovery mode. You have to have a plan that addresses each of these. So when Paul had his um, presentation slide where he was talking about there was one team that was specifically there to address return to work, that would be part of the recovery plan, so to speak. Um, when he talked about the crisis management approach, this again is where we're speaking to the fact that this is like any other crisis. Um, that you would see with the difference, of course, being the impact to health. And of course, the fact that this is a highly contagious health issue means that you have a lot of people impact. So next slide. So when you continue to create this plan, a big part of creating the plan is, is making sure, as we said, when you're following these three stages that you walk through what is the importance of these stages? So in the preparation stage, this is where you're doing a lot of monitoring, you're doing review of your plan, and you're training people to respond to the plan. In the response phase, this is where you're trying to control the situation and you're trying to control your environment to make sure that you reduce the impact um, of the pandemic to your people and to your business, which people includes employees, subcontractors and your community and your, um, 
maintaining your business as much as possible. And then being persistent. Um, part of that is being resilient. Again, this falls under resiliency planning. So tying those two together is you keep trying to make sure you're doing what is necessary to, to get through the pandemic. And then the recovery phase, which is where you return to business. And we say business as usual, recognizing that there could be long-term changes to the way we do business when we are recovering from a pandemic. Um, naturally, a part of that would be you review your response, you make any updates that you need to make. But what is underlying through all of this is the need to communicate. None of this is going to be effective if you don't have a very robust communication plan. So when you're preparing, you're creating a plan that is extremely exhaustive in detail. You've consulted with all of the necessary partners who are making sure you have the right perspective legally, medically, um, and operationally to ensure that your plan is comprehensive. And then you communicate as necessary with the right groups of people. Then in the response again, your, your response plan needs to be well written. It needs to be visual as much as possible, easy for your employees, your subcontractors and your community to understand. And then of course the recovery plan is the same. People want to get a certain sense of relief and hope. So they need to understand that you are also preparing for that scenario. And this one could sometimes be a bit challenging because you have no idea in a pandemic how long this pandemic will last. And we're, we're seeing that here, particularly in the COVID-19 scenario. Next slide for me, please. So as you, as we get ready to transition from me over to, um, to, to Mark for him to continue, I mean, the key thing that I want to leave you guys with is the importance of the communication and people. So Mark, take it over. Yeah, thank you for starting with communication, Tracy. So if we look at the one, we've heard a couple of trends here today. And um, I think we've heard from both Duke and Southern Company are two extremely well organized, very prepared, and they are executing, I'd say, as an industry standard. I mean, they're setting that mark, and that's that's very impressive. Not every organization is out there. We all have very unique, different challenges, and I really like to focus a little bit more on um, some of the utilities on the call here today. Uh, you're all going to have some very different responses because you have different locations different requirements, different marketplaces, and different sets of challenges that we may not have on this call. Um, Southern Company and Duke are approaching things differently as well. So I want to tee up that, take some of the general trends here today and try to utilize throughout your utilities. One of the key points that Tracy discussed earlier is communication. With a pandemic, you're going to have anxiety from your customers, your rate payers, your utility members, your staff, their families, the healthcare infrastructure community suppliers, everybody's going to have a higher sense of anxiety. And that's really where this communication and discussion, communication plan comes in and it's essential. So I think we heard earlier today that the first thing that both Duke and Southern Company focused on was people first. And that's, that's really what I'd like to hit here today addressing that anxiety, addressing the people on your workforce, and dealing with some of their issues early on um, with that communication will allow them to take some of that stress off the table and help support the organization a little bit more effectively. One of the other topics we've heard today is continuity of service. Um, in some cases, I think um, Duke had mentioned that they've, they've had recent tornadoes. They're looking at hurricane season coming in here. Those are all disruptors to the continuity of their service. And because of the effectiveness of their plan and the work they put in on the front end, they're able to attack and deal with that extra challenge um, at the same time, which is not easy. And a lot of your organizations also have challenges. Um, as Tracy mentioned, you're gonna see some hits to your revenue stream. You're gonna see some of your supply chain challenges, um, employee satisfaction, uh, remote working, if that's even an option in some cases. And really that focus on people and then continuity will help help to work through that. And then we move towards planning. Um, I think 
safe to say this is a very challenging situation for everybody. And I don't think anybody when they rolled into 2020 had a global pandemic on the top of their mind. Uh, and so in some cases, this is considered the worst. Um, but we also have to look as when we get through this, what comes 60, 90, 120, or 180 days beyond? Um, do we get past the peak and then a piece of a little bit of calm and then roll back into it? And so we go back to Tracy's comments of preparedness. We may be in the recovery phase in certain cases, but that is also the time to kick off the preparedness phase and start to look at 30, 60, 90, or a year or two out. What does that new normal look like? And communicate those efforts to everybody else in your utility or in your group. When we talk about a little bit about the initial phase, um, and Tracy covered some of this, but the initial response. Um, a lot of your utilities are working through some of that initial response, some of you are further along. Um, some of you are initiating plans, some are preparing those plans right now, and that is no different than what we're experiencing here in the States. I think it's probably safe to say everybody on this call right now is trying to work through some of their initial responses and coming up with ideas and options that we may not have considered earlier. So with that initiation of the plan, um, we focus again on communication, the awareness campaign, possibly putting travel restrictions, quarantine, sequestration, all these options that you heard Duke and Southern Company discuss today, those are all things we may need to consider as we move forward. Next, we move into the uh, pandemic phase. We're also here for a lot of us. And this is really that rollout of the communication plan. Can your employees work at home? What additional challenges does that have? Is that even an option? If people still have to come into the office to perform that work, how do you mitigate their risk? How do you protect your operations? And, and how do you still continue to get work done? At the end of the day, most of the generation facilities, these transmission facilities, they still need maintenance. They still need refueling. They still need to continue to move forward so that other important aspects of society, healthcare, business, um, whatever you may look at, still, need, still can operate. This is really the base. And then we move into future planning. And here's an area that I think we can all take a look at, and I think USEA has done a nice job of setting this up, is number two on this list is lessons learned. Um, folks here on the call today are trying to relay some of the lessons learned that we're learning in some cases quicker than we planned, um, faster than we had hoped for, uh, but to roll that out for others. And we're also learning from everybody else on the call here today. So I'd encourage everybody as you start to look at your utility pandemic plan, whether it be the response, the execution or future planning to, as Tracy said, rely on your other coworkers. Uh, take a look at USEA programs. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, you have joint partnerships with other utilities in the region. Really rely on that knowledge and that information to help build these plans. Because uh, that information will flow much faster uh, through those collaborative efforts, such as today's USEA call. Um, oh, all right. Uh, yep, elements of utility plan. I think we've discussed this pretty heavily, but I, I just want to cover it one last time. Um, trust is, I'd say, probably the key portion here. And this is building the trust with your other with your employees. It's the trust with your supply chain, your regulatory officials, and your team members. Um, that's building the trust with the, with the guy on the ground all the way through the executive that you're handling this efficiently, effectively, and safely for your teams. Um, early action, um, that is really the planning phase. In some cases, we are past the planning phase, and now we're in a little bit more of a response phase. Uh, but we can still get out ahead and start to plan further ahead in that process, which is gonna be essential. And then finally, communication. I would say communication underpins everything we've talked about today. Um, coming up with a great plan is, is phenomenal. But if you can't communicate that plan to your employees, to your marketplace, to build that trust about the actions you're taking, it, you, that is the secret sauce to get to move forward. So um, I really want to just want to wrap up, like I said, Today is about some, looking at some best practices that Duke and Southern Company have put into place, um, learning a bit about some of the phases of the pandemic plan, 
but also more importantly, recognizing that everybody here has very, very different challenges and very different locations they have to deal with, revenue streams, customers, cultures, and what that may be. And you have to tailor your plan to the specific set of resources. But reach out. I mean, USEA and your other part, USEA partnership um, teams are going to be a huge resource in that process. And with that said, I believe that is, I'm gonna turn this back to the moderator. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, great presentations by all panelists and generated a lot of questions. A uh, Couple of themes have come up, uh, specifically at the utility, so I wanna start with that. And I'll start with uh, Harry, if you don't mind. One of the questions, we have questions from India and also Rwanda about the effect of the COVID-19 on energy demand. Their demand is going down. What effect does that have on must-run plants, on your uh, wholesale market operations, your grid, your system operators, and that sort of thing? What, what kind of effect does that have on the, the least demand have on your operations? Yeah, we're, we're seeing the, the same, uh, maybe not to the same extreme as what I see from Italy and some other places that I've, I've read some data on. Uh, but our system is robust enough and interconnected enough to where we've been able to balance that. Uh, we got a lot of our, our fossil plants are not running. Uh, and that, that allows our base load must run plants to continue to run. We have had to curtail some of the renewable resources. Um, as, as the, especially in the, uh, the mild weather that we have and the sun is out, the solar facilities, we've had to curtail some of those outputs to, to allow our base load must run facilities to run. But so far has not been a big issue for us to manage the, the grid stability uh, and the resiliency. And we have not, but again, I, I'd say we have not seen the big drop off that, that I've seen in some other countries. Paul, any, uh response on that? I, I think I would echo a little bit of what Harry said there. Our territories um, butt up against each other, so I think we oftentimes see a lot of the same types of um, load changes and variability. Uh, I completely agree with the must-run units that you need to have going. Um, I think importantly, too, what we're seeing is, you know, while, while I don't see necessarily all the, the load destruction as far as long-term, um, we are certainly seeing it as you would expect in the commercial and industrial segments more so, whereas your residential segment is uh, actually up right now with all the people working from home. Okay. Uh, another side of that for the utilities, again, uh, several questions on this, and that is in, in a lot of the countries, the, the, the people that are watching this are, are in areas where they're already revenue short and because of losses on their lines, uh, non-payment or whatever. So what what an impacts do the, the utilities here think they're going to have due to uh, not paying bills, late payments, uh, foregoing payment bills and so on? How do you handle that, you know, in, in the long term with your regulators and, and with your bottom line? I'll, I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, it's still too early to tell exactly what this is going to look like. We do anticipate impacts, obviously. Um, you know, we, what we've been trying to do is communicate with those customers, try to, try to get the ones that we feel like are going to be at risk uh, of paying their bills and uh, work with them on payment plans, payment arrangements, even now uh, to be able to, to help smooth that curve coming to them. Uh, we're also going to be working with our regulators to make sure that they understand the impacts of the company uh, and what those are. Uh, so still a lot to come on that. Uh, like I said, just getting into that now with, with being about a month into it right now. Yeah, I think you captured all the, the key talking points there. We are only about a month into it. So I think it's going to be in this next cycle that we'll start to see some impacts uh, with bills. As I mentioned in the presentation too, we have suspended disconnects. So at least that's helping some of the immediate uh, customers that may have some needs. And I think to Harry's point, it's going to be uh, critically important that we work with our regulators to find a good path forward. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on this, on the supplier side, you know, when, uh, Generally, up until this pandemic uh, event, when we had a, 
uh, emergency on the utility, it was a hurricane in the south, you know, an ice storm in the north, or fires out west, or tornadoes, whatever, in the, uh, in the Midwest. Uh, and therefore, as a supplier, you were able to focus your resources on a small geographic area and a few customers. The pandemic effect has affected all customers across the United States. So the supplier now has got to look at all his suppliers. How has that affected you from a supplier to utilities in the way that you provide services uh, to your utility? Yeah. <clears throat> so first, we look at it in two ways. We look at what are the projects that we we actually have ongoing. So what we supply is a service, it's not products. And, and that can make it even, even much trickier because now we have to think also about the safety of our um, employees in addition to the safety of our customers' employees. So what we've done in our plans is we've reached out to understand which projects um, that we currently have that are vital projects that we need to continue um, as a supplier, we have LDs, for example, for um, if we don't reach deadlines. So with that particular customer, we'll ask to see whether or not there will be relief. Um, figuring out how can we create a backup supply of, of um, people in the event you have such an impact to your team that you need to reach out to us to see whether or not we can, um, we can of course, second team members from ourselves to you to support. But the biggest thing is looking at what projects can be delayed, which ones must go on, and how do we restaff and resource to make sure that we do have resources available for any um, requests that we may have from our customers. Um, so far, what we're seeing, though, is many projects, especially if they're renewables related, many projects are being delayed, and we have been shifting staff back and forth. Our company has both commercial, meaning hospitals, schools, universities, concert halls. So we have that set of staff plus our energy staff. And we've actually been trying to shift where the skills are commutable. We've been trying to shift people back and forth because that industry, believe it or not, has slowed down significantly. Um, so we now have staff um, team members available that can come in and support us in certain positions. Mark, anything to add? Yeah, I would just add on to Tracy. Uh, Tracy's spot on. One of the key components of that transition and those changes will, is really that communication aspect. Very proactive communication with our customers, the utilities, and the other vendors that we're working with, as well as the communication with our trade partners and employees that we're moving around to backfill different projects and to allocate resources differently. That right. helps relay that, that anxiety that they may feel, um, which helps them to focus on the work they have to do and the safety aspect. Um, but also, I, I think, helps us build those long-term relationships with utilities, our trade partners, and industry. Because at some point in time, uh, we will get through COVID-19 and, and, and move to a, a new normal. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I, 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 uh, next question. You all sort of addressed this in, uh, in your presentations, but it has to do a lot of questions that we're getting uh, about IT infrastructure, and that is, how is how you your technology enabled to provide continuity of service and also customer response uh, during this uh, time of the of the COVID event? And also, did the infrastructure uh, how was it able to maintain people working from home? The security of people working from home, having laptops for those people to work from home, all those sorts of things that come with all this remote activity. So I'll just uh, uh, start with Paul. Sure, sure. And I tell you, I have to give a lot of kudos to our IT department. For one, they had the foresight a few years back to expand the capacity of our abilities to do remote working. And so we've seen a peak of about, I guess it's about 16,000 unique uh, online uh, remote access employees. And, and our capacity really is more in the neighborhood of about 30,000. So. We're in very good shape as far as capabilities for remote working. I mentioned earlier about um, making sure we maintain good cyber hygiene as well. And our IT security group has um, enacted a few other systems as well to help bolster what we already had in place to ensure that we had you know, good safety. I think other areas that I've seen a little bit of um, assistance being done in was um, there's a, a real 
I guess they've worked with supply chain. There's a large purchase of laptops to help assist with employees who wanted to work from home that maybe didn't have the uh, computers up front. And so uh, there was a real surge in that, but it's been handled now. And then Any problem in getting also, laptops? I'm sorry? Any problem in procuring laptops? Were they available? No, uh, obviously early on, um, it strained the channels. And so, but once we kind of spaced it out, we found we were able to get it to, and we had to, we, we worked with all the HR teams and all the, the critical ops groups to determine kind of a prioritization of, of which, pro, which processes are critical and who needs to get those laptops first. Um, so IT did a great job of identifying that need and making sure we get it out to the people that need it first. Okay, Harry? get unmuted here. Uh, yeah, very similar. Our, our IT group did an amazing job. Uh, they had the foresight to get started uh, way before everybody else did in the company when this started uh, becoming an issue. So procuring laptops, uh, making sure the pipes were big enough to handle that. And we have about 18,000 people working from home uh, and doing video conferencing and, and those kind of things. So, so we've been able to, to do it without a glitch. Uh, cybersecurity was one of the big concerns. We have to make sure that our folks are, are being mindful of our cybersecurity practices and our, our crews are doing the, the right things there, just, just like Southern Company mentioned. Uh, the other thing is, is personal information. So like I said, our call center reps that have access to people's billing information, they're working from home, making sure that they have the proper processes and isolated from roommates and other things that are going on. I'd say the only glitch that we've had working from home is when the storms came through and the power went out. Uh, we had some issues when people didn't have power, which, you know, is, is expected. So we got to feel it firsthand, just like our customers did. But that, that's really been the only glitch that we've had. Yeah, I was one of your miserable customers, Harry. <laughs> Anything you'd add, Tracy? No, I would say, I mean, the, the, the big thing for us is just that I work remotely um, and we have staffed our team members with laptops for, for many years now, even the ones who do most of their, their duties um, in the office. Very similarly, um, because many of the utilities have a requirement that those of us who are their vendors and suppliers have some cybersecurity um, regulations that we have to meet. We've been ramping up and doing the same thing because the biggest thing is to secure the, the infrastructure and to prevent any of all the potential cyber threats from having an impact creating an N minus one, minus one or N minus two situation, which is very, very difficult to respond to. So we've just continued to be very robust in our program. Um, for us in particular, though, I will point this out, and I'm not sure if Duke or, or Southern have done this. We've put our management team, meaning our C-suite and above, on rotation. And they go in these rotations. You spend two weeks in, and you're the people who are on site at HQ, and then you come out of rotation, and then the other person comes in two weeks, or the other team. So they've got like an A, B, C team going right now. We're doing that to some extent in our own organization. So I am... I work from home, but there are other team members who are rotating in and out specifically at our management level. Um, and that kind of helps. It helps with people getting comfortable that there's not cross-contamination, but it also helps even with relieving the congestion on the, um, on the pipes, so to speak. So that's the approach that we've taken and we've seen other organizations take. Thank you, Tracy. Mark, anything to add? No, nothing really to add. I'd say the the company and, and has done a really nice job of this. I'd say the biggest impact from some of the remote working hasn't necessarily been the cyber. It's just been the individual interconnection as from various employees where we've been at. Some are slower. Um, you do have bandwidth issues. And then I would say overall, um, back to that communication with moving to more remote work, I would say an increased number of meetings. Um, spend a good portion of the day on video calls or other calls um, as we enhance that communication and try to work through the issues. But um, besides our meetings, and that, that, I think it's worked pretty smooth. Jim, let me say one quick thing that I forgot to mention. We talked about people. This is the one time where you really need to be mindful of um, productivity and how the pandemic 
is affecting different people and their productivity. I have one team member who is so stressed out. Um, her productivity is a lot less and we do create much like I think Southern and Duke have a billing code. So you can bill for, if you're going to take three days because you're just three hours, because you're so stressed, bill it there. It's, we, we create it as an option. So recognize that in spite of the best system that you may have, there is going to be an impact to productivity because this is a very emotional time. And we need to be aware that although we try to keep our emotions away from work, and when you're working from home with wife, child, maybe even parents and grandparents, you are not going to get the same productivity. And you should not expect the same productivity. It would be highly um, stressful for an, for an employee to feel that kind of um, demand on them. So something to keep in mind. That really uh, keys up a question that I've had from several, that we see from several people uh, that are on the webinar, and that is, uh, have you had any instances of employees that just won't work? They just uh, are afraid of, for whatever reasons, they, they don't want to participate in their normal work activity? I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, obviously, it's, it's anxious for everybody. Uh, you know, I always uh, say we got great employees. They, they, they understand their mission. Uh, they signed up to be utility workers for a reason. They understand what goes with it, having to be out there in the storms having to be out there in these circumstances to provide that essential service. We did a really nice job of communicating. And, and like I said, in our guiding principles, they were put first. Their safety is put first. So by being able to, to communicate with them, tell them that we're essential, that we're going to take every step, but if, if we can't take every step to protect them, then they were, we weren't going to do the work, has set them at ease. I, th I still think there's some angst. Uh, we saw a lot of it in the call center that first week because a lot of their – uh, a lot of other folks that were office workers per se were going home and they were being brought back into the call centers to work and, and be, they felt like they were be, being put at risk. That's why we moved quickly to get them at home. So since that's happened, uh, we haven't had a lot of, a lot of concerns from that. Uh, making sure that they have the, the personal protection equipment, the, the masks, the gloves, that, that was a key item. So uh, is there angst? Yes. Uh, but I think if you can communicate properly, make sure they understand that you're putting their safety first and giving them the equipment to do that is great. Uh, we've taken some surveys, uh, some pulse surveys of our employees to make sure that we're listening to them. Uh, they feel like they're being listened to and it, it's pretty unanimously that they feel comfortable that management and the company is doing everything they can to help them that they have their best interest at mind and they're being listened to. So I think all those communications things that were mentioned earlier are very important in this area too. Well, anything? There? I think the only thing I would add to Harry, everything he said was just, it was spot on. Um, you know, we, we put early on an accommodation system in place, the HR and our disability management team um, administer. And, and there they allow for the workers that have you know, extenuating circumstances, whether it is they're in a high risk category, whether it is they have challenges with child care or elder care. Um, so all those things we would work on in a case by case basis. I think what's interesting is along the lines of what Harry said as well is as we supplied PPE or facial coverings to the on site workers, um, there was that confidence that began to grow. Uh, in addition, for our call center workers, most of them were able to do remotely. And ironically, we've seen a decrease in absenteeism from normal periods um, because I think you're taking out commute times and other issues that may have taken away from people being able to be on site. So uh, a surprising positive there that I think is a lesson learned as we think going forward, how we might change our company in the future. Yeah. How about you or Tracy? You yeah, I, I mean, I would add that. So one of the things is making sure that you have you understand the company well enough so you can categorize your employees. And you can find this on this on the um, the SCC um, website where you know you have your energy workers, then you have your critical infrastructure employees, and the category that they fit in the people who are necessary to do the work but could do the work from home, much like both um, both you know, Southern and Duke had identified. And then your mission, mission essential workers. And the mission essential workers are the ones, in our opinion, that we had to pay even an extra set of attention to because these are the people who need to be 
in their physical locations to do the work. And these are the ones where we had to say, do you want to be here? Giving them the option of bowing out and figuring out how do we then come up with our plan B or C if we have too many who opted out. Because we didn't want anybody to feel like we're mandating for you to, to be here if you just have a less, a lower tolerance of risk than we would. And believe it or not, very few people took that position, much like um, both Paul and Harry are getting from Duke and Southern. So we would say that that would be one big strategy is to really start to categorize the job functions to say, who can work from home and who needs to be in the office? And then for those who need to be in the office, what is your plan for rotation? I know one utility who actually sequesters their control center staff with trailers so they were allowed to bring their own personal trailers in they got cleaned they have a remote cleaning staff who comes in to clean and then those guys stay there for 30 days and in that process they're tested before and tested after they leave they have a food vending truck that's there um, also going through their own um, rotation of of processes to ensure that they're staying healthy and they are not, um, no potential or limited potential for contamination. So it's a very, very detailed plan that goes into place, but understanding how you're going to categorize your, your employees, I think is step one. And then of course, planning rotations with teams and so on is step two. Not everybody needs to be sequestered. Not, not everybody is gonna need to be quarantined, but you need to make that decision based on the functions that you know require manned supervision. A little slightly different approach. Um, I know we've talked a little bit about anxiety and not doing the work, but I think it's also important to talk about the change that employees and members of our companies are all experiencing. Uh, typically, when you go to work, you can put home to the side a little bit. Um, you can focus on your work. Now that work is being brought into your home, someplace that you're not accustomed to. Uh, when you're at work, um, you can grab a cup of coffee, you can step away. Now that work has suddenly been placed on the kitchen table, there's no place else to really walk to. You throw a kid's family, their task, other issues on there, it becomes a lot more stressful for employees and such. So it's a slightly different take on the anxiety where people just not working, but I think it's also taking into account that um, with this, employees are, you're seeing a heightened level of anxiety, um, not only due to what's going on outside their house and outside their job, uh, but also having that job in their home, near their family, near their pets, um, and, and everything else that, that may entail. So that's just something else to look at and that we need to be aware of as we move through and we're leading our teams. Thank you, Mark. So I want to expand a little bit on a point that Tracy brought up. Uh, and that is, uh, under under uh, under a normal situation like a storm, you you can manage that locally. But this affects the corporate structure and how it responds to uh, an event like this. And so the question is, how did your executive group reorganize in order to provide 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service? Did you have uh, responsibility and matrix or other responsibility uh, areas in mind if somebody can't work, if somebody, if one of the key executive or a key business manager gets COVID and has to go in isolation, how do you manage through that? And, and how do you continue with your local government, press, uh, customer relations and all that? How, how do you continue to manage that on a 24-hour basis at an executive level? So, Paul, you want to take a shot at that? Sure, sure. And I think that that alludes a lot to the structure that I had laid out in one of my first slides. When you think yeah. about how we utilize this system incident support team um, to really support the executive. So, to the extent, you know, luckily we have not had any issues in our C suite, um, but to the extent we did, we certainly have people prepared to fill in as a part of our crisis management plan, we have identified backups and, and third backups um, for each of those players. Um, so I do think we're, we're prepared. We've always kind of 
thought about the milk truck strategy if anybody were to be struck. And, and we're the first to say, there's nobody in our company, um, I hope I don't lose my job over this, but nobody in this company um, is irreplaceable. Um, and so we have uh, backup plans for everyone. Uh, as far as the 24 seven aspect of this, you're absolutely right. I think in the worst scenarios in our, in our past, thinking about hurricanes and such, I think we were turned on for maybe two weeks, something like that. This is clearly going beyond a two week period. And so fatigue is an issue. Um, matter of fact, when you think about operations, one of the things we were considering around sequestration plans is to the extent we do need to turn that on for our control centers or our plant control rooms, um, of keeping that to a shorter period. Um, and that's just our belief that we think we've seen, you know, we have peers that are turning on for 30 days and sequestering people. Um, we've, we've read studies and all that say, you know what, after about seven days, you, you start to increase the risk of mistakes. And so we've structured our plans to be more of a seven day type rotation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if that gets at all the question. Maybe, maybe Harry has a few things yeah. he can add. Yeah, very similar. I mean, our structure, I mean, it, it looks very similar. Um, you know, the, the SMC we call, which is the C-suite, uh, we, we have uh, daily reports. We have uh, a couple of times a week we, we come together to, to form what we call the crisis management team, which is the senior leaders as well as some key folks off our incident command teams. So they keep us informed. We have a contingency plan of who, if any of us got sick, who would take, take our spot. And that's three or four layers deep and also deeper in the organization where there's critical components. I would reiterate what Paul said, you know, what I've been preaching to my team is this isn't a storm where it's over in a few days or in a week. Uh, you have to pace yourself. So, you know, we don't have the same, uh, you know, hundred miles an hour, we, can, we, we just couldn't survive doing that. So you have to pace yourself, focus on what's really crucial and important and have backups and have people doing uh, multiple functions so they can back each other up and give each other a break so they can decompress to, to keep their mental sanity going. Mm -hmm. So very, very similar to what, what Paul talked about. Tracy, you've sort of hit on this before. Right, I hit on it already. What we did was we did walk through and um, create, you know, um, different categories for employees. Then we took every operating group as well as the overall business leadership and um, assigned them to teams and rotated those teams, um, you know, for the same reasons, you know, you don't want people to get burnout. I mean, in the US, we don't use the term burnout a lot. But having worked at the European company, when I worked for ABB, you actually could take burnout day and after you've worked there for a couple of years you actually were allowed it's it's very crazy but they were allowed to actually get you know a three or four day out of a week where they could actually go off to a retreat to you know gather themselves and recenter and i thought this is such a novel idea because i'll be pushing it in my organization so wish me luck here but the idea of burnout is a really big thing and we have to recognize that again that goes back to expectations, setting the right expectations, and being very mindful of people. Again, Mark hinted at it. We've said it here. When you're working from home, home was your refuge from everything else. When you're working from home, um, you have a set of issues. But when you can't come home for 30 days, you have a whole other host of issues that could be really even as, as impactful, if not more, depending on your situation at home. So it really is a very um, inclusive process where team members must feel free to say, yes, I am able to do this. No, I'm not. Or yes, I am. And then they go, wait, I changed my mind. It's too hard. I need to make some adjustments. So we have to create a very flexible plan when it comes to how we are um, rotating our employees and our management. Mark, I'll give you a final comments and I'll turn it over to Marjorie. We're about at the end of our time to any closing comments she has. Yeah, the only closing comment I have is uh, thank you for USEA for inviting us all here for the presentation today. Uh, this has been great um, and very, very happy. And thank you for our, partic thank you for our um, participants for joining us today. Uh, hopefully this is of value and I think reach out to USEA if there's any other questions or answers that we can supply in the future. But thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Marjorie, any closing comments? You're on mute.
apologies. Am I off mute? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, my apologies. I'm not sure if we we're able to get to all the questions that were submitted. And if we did not, my apologies for that. Um, I want to go ahead and thank you very, very much, all of the participants. Jeff, unfortunately, had to get off the line. But thank you to Harry, Paul, Tracy, and Mark for taking time out of your busy schedule. Because I do know in this new era of working from home, it has gotten busier. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule participating in our webinar. Um, for the people who attended the webinar, thank you for taking time for also attending. We are going to send you a short survey at the end just to kind of gauge your interest in follow on uh, webinars on various topics to see if this webinar is very useful for you. If you see if you wanted additional webinars, just to kind of see how we can continue to assist you in this, um, in this new normal of operating. So again, on behalf of USCA and as well USAID, thank you very much for not only participating, but also being willing to share your experiences, your insights, and also submitting questions. Thank you very much.